Whoa. All right. Nothing worse than a training at three o'clock. So thank you so much for joining us. The only thing that would be worse, right, would be if this was a Friday before vacation or something. So we won't do that to you. But um, thank you so much for joining us. You are here, hopefully, because you are part of our cohort, our 23-24 cohort for monitoring and supervision. And what we're going to quickly go over for you today is how to choose IEPs for your self-assessment. We are going to tell you exactly how to choose your IEPs, how to look at them and make the best choices so that they are super compliant. We're gonna tell you exactly what we're gonna be looking for, no surprises. And we're gonna talk about the uh, procedural manual. It's a great resource if you do not already have access to it. This is the link that will take you directly to it. And you can see the table of contents that lists everything that is encompassed in this procedural manual, as well as the IEP committee that put it together. It was a great team that put it together. And of course, MUSE are the main unified special education regulations. This is the link that will take you directly to those regulations that uh, we are operating under all the time. Before I move forward, I just want to apologize. Generally, we try to drop in a copy of the PowerPoint. I know for me, when I'm at a training, I really like to have, <clears throat> excuse me, access to the PowerPoint so that I can take notes and everything. But unfortunately, we had a little glitch, so we weren't able to do that. So what we'll do on the back end is when we email everything out, all of the resources and everything, we'll make sure you have a copy of the PowerPoint. So my apologies to you for that. But this is our team. My name is Colette Sullivan. I am the federal programs coordinator. I get to work with this exceptionally gifted team every day. Before I joined the department about five years ago, I was a special education teacher. I worked in special ed for 30 years, primarily with students with autism. Um, Jennifer is doing another training for me, as well as Carly. They are both doing a CAP-specific training with another SAU, but Ashley is here with me. So Ashley, if you could come on and say hello, please, that'd be really great. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Satry. I am the newest member of this monitoring team, and I've been here about two months, so I am learning right along with you guys and will rely heavily on Colette today. Um, but before this, I was a special ed teacher here in Maine, and also at a special purpose um, school in Virginia for um, 14 years total. Jumped right in, she's doing awesome. Thanks, Ashley. <laughs> and Julie. Hi, I am Julie Pelletier. I've been with the DOE, I'm in my sixth year. And prior to joining DOE, I was admin support at a K to five elementary school for 16 years. And Colette, I might have figured I might be able to get in to do that link. As soon as it stops spinning, which it's been doing for us all morning, I'm going to drop something in and hopefully it works. Thank you, Julie. So fingers crossed. All right. This is our contact information. But if you have received your August email, you have a contact person who will be your primary contact person throughout the monitoring and supervision process. However, please feel free to reach out to any of us. If you have any questions throughout the process, please feel free to reach out to any of us. So our agenda today, we just quickly did introductions. If you have not already done so, please in chat, drop in your name, where you're from and your role. Cause like I mentioned, we like to know who's with us. We are going to review the expectations of the self-assessment. We're gonna just walk through all the considerations of the process itself. We're gonna talk about the timelines. And just as we go through, we're a pretty small group this afternoon. So please feel free if we're going too fast, if you need us to stop and clarify or repeat anything, or if you have any questions, just stop us, just interrupt us and we'll, we'll stop and, and answer those questions as we go through. Or if you're more comfortable putting something in chat, feel free to do that. Ashley and Julie, I don't have the chat box. I don't have access to it when I'm presenting. So if you see something pop up, let me know. It'd be great. Will do. Thank you. So as I mentioned, you are part of our 23-24 cohort for audit and review. And this is part of the general supervision system. It is outlined in MUSER. And we put that link in at the beginning. 
And we like to just start out by talking about some of the things that we have seen during previous on-site visits, just to sort of front load you about some, some, just some components that we want you to really think about so that as you're engaging in the process, you'll just really be aware of some of the things that we want you to not do or just to really remember. So during previous on-site visits, during, during previous monitoring, we saw in 50% of the IEPs that were reviewed, they did not meet compliance because of the following. So gaps were identified, but there were no corresponding goals. So for every gap that's identified, we wanna see a goal. How statements were missing, goals were not measurable because they included references to specific curriculum standards, Goals were not measurable because they included multiple skills and therefore they couldn't clearly be reported on during progress monitoring. Present levels didn't include, didn't include clear um, baseline data or they included statements such as child struggles with sometimes, th those types of statements. They didn't align with a service services didn't align with the goals. Remember, every goal needs a service and every so service needs a goal. Or section 9F on the IEP, which is part of the transition plan, includes child will statements. Now, we're going to talk about each one of these as we move through this presentation, but these are just some highlights we like to just have you really think about. So we're going, I'm going to stop right here and let Ashley jump in, but I just want to highlight a couple of things real quick. The top of each one of these slides are the codes. We do not expect you to remember the codes. These are the internal codes that we focus on. Those are the findings. And you can see that each one of these slides will have the finding followed by the section of the IEP where we will look, followed by the MUSER or the IDEA reference. And then we're gonna talk about each one of those areas. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this right over to Ashley. All right, thanks Colette. Um, okay, so we're going to jump right into section four of the IEP. So um, RAE1, section 4A, is where you're going to put the results of the initial or most recent evaluations of the child, which most of us know, but we're going to look at what we specifically want to see there to look for compliance. So that is going to be um, in 4A. We're going to want to see the academic and functional and developmental evaluations that were used in eligibility decisions, any relevant state and district assessments, um, any transition assessments for transition aid students, um, other assessments you might use that are um, used for programming decisions or goals, things like that. Um, that would be like an FBA or um, any related services. Um, and in that, when you're putting those in 4A, we want to see the evaluation name, the date of the evaluation, and the scores. And most often what we see missed is the date of the evaluation. So just getting into that practice of putting the date for pretty much everything you can't go wrong with giving us too many dates in there. So we'll take that. Um, and then that takes us to section 4B, which is AFS-1. Again, you don't need to know that, um, but that AFS-1 piece, um, but that's going to be your academic, functional, developmental strength of the child. So in that section, we are going to be looking for strengths or relative strengths that the student is showing in their learning. Um, for academic performance, we want to see strengths in reading, writing, listening, speaking, and math problem, problem solving. Um, and one of the tricks I like to use for that, if you are not sure what to use for a strength, is when it's a continuing student who um, already had IEP goals with you and you're reporting on progress, what they've done on that for those previous goals and where they are. So that shows the strength. It also covers you for um, showing that growth, um, but just make sure you're putting there for academic and functional. And functional would be those areas of cognitive, communicative, communicative, motor, adaptive, social, emotional, or sensory. You can tell it's getting late in the afternoon. Uh, <laughs> Um, so these will be based on evaluations and observations in the classroom. Um, I like to 
jump right down to that bottom bullet and think, what does that strength look like in the classroom? It helps kind of um, narrow down what you can write there. Um, a lot of parents and team members like to add things and talk about all the strengths of a student and they're really important. Um, but if you wanna be a little bit more concise in 4B, you could always add that other information that's maybe not so programmatically important in the written notice, like strengths they have in sports or things like that that a parent might bring up um, because we really wanna see what it looks like in the classroom for their strengths or relative strengths. Um, that brings us to APG2, which is section 4C, and that's the academic gaps or skill deficits. And that is a two part in 4C. We wanna see the skill, specific skill deficit and the academic how statement of how that skill gap affects their um, progress in the general ed setting, uh, which we'll go into detail here. So section 4C, this is one of those bullets on that previous slide to um, where we see this in a lot of IEPs where the how statement is missing. So um, step one in 4C is identifying the distinctly measurable and persistent gap in academic performance. And then step two is that how statement of how that deficit has an adverse impact on the child accessing the curriculum. So making sure you have both pieces. Um, this gives those broad areas on the left um, where we are looking at those academics, which would be reading, writing, listening, speaking, and math. Um, but what we really would like to see in the skill deficits here are the specific area that you're teaching the student. So what the specific goal is going to be around, um, whether that be phonemic awareness, that actual uh, measurable piece that you're working on in your goal. Um, so try to avoid those broad academic areas. We see that quite often, um, and we really want to see those specific areas um, in detail. And we recommend that those be listed in a bulleted list too. So I'll get back to that. Um, but if you, here's a good example of how to take the gap and um, write that into a how statement so that you're covered for your how statement. Um, an example for reading for Jimmy, his specific uh, distinctly measurable gap would be Jimmy's reading fluency. And that deficit impacts his ability to access grade level reading material. So it's overcomplicated, I think, sometimes. People really want to specifically detail um, how they're struggling in the classroom, but all we need to see is that that deficit is impacting their access to the gen ed curriculum. Um, and at the bottom, we have a little um, kind of formula for how you could use, obviously this is just a, a partial list. And if you had your specific distinctly measurable gap, how to fill that in, um, in that formulaic uh, format down there. So, um, all right, APG six, and this is where we start to talk about al uh, alignment. You'll hear us say that all the time. So every one of those a uh, bulleted skill gap that you put in 4C is going to need to be linked to a goal. So every specific, uh, every identified academic skill deficit should have its own goal. You should be able to count the bullets and count the goals and match them up. And that's what we're looking for. Um, so as long as they all are covered, we will find that compliant. This is a tricky one. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to jump in. But um, this is an example of what we're looking for for that alignment. So in 4C, we have a student who has the specific skill gaps of addition with regrouping and single digit subtraction. We have the, the uh, following how statement saying that those gaps in math computation affect their involvement in the gen ed curriculum. So that's covering your how statement. And then aligning to that, you've got two goals which address both of those skill gaps. So this would be considered a compliant academic uh, 4C and goals. Uh, and then this is gonna sound very similar. I'm gonna um, pass it off to Colette just to make sure if she's got anything she wants to fill in, um, but we'll be looking for something very similar for the functional section here. Great, thanks Ashley. 
Yeah, like she mentioned, this is very similar. So just like with the academic section, we're going to outline it the same way. So the functional developmental gaps or those skill deficits of the child paired with the how statement, we need both of those components. So you need those distinctly measurable and persistent gaps in that functional performance paired with the deficit how that has an adverse impact on the child's ability to access that gen ed curriculum. So as we shared with the academic, you have those broad areas. And as Ashley mentioned, we do not want you to identify those broad areas because those are much too broad, right? So you wouldn't want to identify that the child has skill deficits in cognitive. You'd want to break those down into more specific areas. So on the right hand side of that grid, there are some examples and there are certainly many more examples than what we've given here. So cognitive could include problem solving, self-awareness, peer interaction, self-initiation or similar. And I know that you could give me many, many more. So you can see here, Mary's deficits and problem solving, which falls under that broad cognitive area. That's her, her skill deficit. And the how statement, it impacts her ability to safely engage with peers at grade level. So again, you've identified that persistent measurable skill gap, you've paired it with that how statement. So you've got both of those components, so that would certainly be compliant. I have a question. Are you saving those until the end or can we ask no, those? No, absolutely. Jump in whenever you feel, feel, feel oh. appropriate. So yeah. Great. So in the, uh, hi, so it's Catherine. I'm a, an OT. And um, so okay. my question is in, in the functional area, um, we like to say, you know, here's what uh, OT says. Here's what uh, social work says. Here's what speech says. And I would think that would make it even easier to link back, you know, here are the two deficits I've identified, you know, and then there's are my two goals. Is that correct? Like, do you want to be seeing it kind of split up like that? So give me an example of how you would say that. So like, like OT. So I would just like say OT colon, you know, um, Mary's uh, deficits in um, problem solving impact her ability, blah, blah, right. And, you know, uh, Mary's fine motor deficits in, you know, um, handwriting, you know, so I would do my two things. Sure. And then like social work would be like social work colon, then then she's got totally other things that link back to her goals around like peer interactions and that kind of stuff, right? That would be perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And our and our guidance around the skill deficits would be to bullet them. It just makes it easier, like Ashley said, it just makes it so much easier um, to just align those skill deficits directly to goals. But yeah, if you want to break them out that way, of course, that makes perfect sense. Right. And then the uh, other thing, sorry, now I'm asking another question, then I'll no, stop. No, um, you don't around stop. these needs, I know you said there are more, right? Mm -hmm, there could be, um, sure. So uh, I like the bucketing, right? So we have the cognitive, communicative, motor, thank you, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, a lot of times we're talking about executive functioning, which of course is like, um, that's the problem solving, organization, planning, all of that stuff. And so I'd like to use, uh, I would specify the specific areas, like you're saying on the right side of the screen, but then executive functioning can also be, you know, then at the bottom say, okay, these deficits in executive functioning impact the access to the gen ed curriculum. Would that be correct? Executive function, I would, or I would argue is very broad. Too broad. Okay. Yeah. That's where I was just wanted to clarify. So we should just yeah. keep it at what's on the right side of the screen and, and it doesn't really matter what's on the left side. Like we're not gonna use the words on the left side because those are too broad. That's just to yes. help us organize. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, no, great questions. And don't ever apologize for questions. There's nothing worse than doing a presentation to, you know, when nobody responds or I love questions and back and forth. So yeah, feel free. Oh, I just skipped one. All right. FDP 7 speaks to, well, we just talked about that, the how statement, right? Okay. Did that, did that, did that. Okay. Alignment. So this is that alignment piece again, except around in the functional area. So you've got the, the gaps aligning to a goal, just like with the academics. So again, if you've identified a gap 
it should be aligned to a goal. So if you have four functional skill deficits, four functional gaps, you should have four functional goals. So again, if you bullet them, it makes it much easier to identify the gaps. So you can see here, we've got two skill deficits in that functional area, the how statement, and we've got two gaps, uh, two goals. It's just much easier to, to identify that. So Sammy has skill deficits in his ability to follow a visual schedule and a skill deficit in his ability to request help. And both of those, we were able to pair those to one how statement. Sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't, but those gaps affect his ability to access age appropriate classroom activities. And then you can see that those uh, link down to those two goals. Questions on any of that before we move on? Anything in chat? Nope. Perfect. All right, present level. So APG3, we would look in section five of the IEP. And this is where we look at present level of academic achievement. And one really important thing about uh, present level is this is a must fill. Per IDEA, this cannot be left blank. So even if the child does not have any academic programming, they only have functional programming, this still needs a statement about present level. It cannot be left blank. So for example, if the student has, like I mentioned, only functional program, you would just want a statement here that just states, Walter is on academic grade level with peers or no academic needs at this time or academically commensurate with his peers. Something along those lines. You would only need to make that statement in the first present level statement area. Obviously you wouldn't have goals, but please it's very important that this cannot be left blank. It is an IDEA requirement. However, if you are going to have goals in this area, you would really want to think about your present level as your baseline data. Where is that student functioning right now at this time? And Jennifer, who is on our team, always says, trust your data. Make your data very clear and concise and try to really avoid any of those statements like often or sometimes or seems to or you know, any of those statements that are really vague or unclear. We seem to, uh, we see ranges, like the student, uh, there's the example here, students reading comprehension is between 50 and 75%. Well, is the student's reading comprehension 50 or is it 75? That's quite a range, right? Or student can articulate digraphs less than 40%. Well, that's, that is again, quite a range. So approximately 55%, what does that mean? Give us an exact data point. And we are going to trust your data point. If you tell me 41%, 17%, whatever you tell us the data point is, we're going to trust you. We're not gonna to say to you, show me the data sheets that, that, that give you that. We're gonna trust you. So trust your data point, okay? If you start with that baseline data to support your present level, it's going to make it much easier to write your measurable goal, and then your progress monitoring will happen. It, it, it makes the process so much better. So really, if you, if you start with the present level, the rest of it, I promise you, will be much, much easier to do. SBG1 is talking about, we will look in section five to section four C, so that is also about alignment. That's where we look again at the child's needs, the present level, and looking at their achievement, the grade level standards. So we're just looking to make sure that the alignment piece is in place. So do the evaluations support the disability? Are there it, the, do the, are the skill gaps identified? Is the present level there? And are there goals that, that support all of that? SBG3 is in section five, and that's, are the goals measurable? So we would expect to look to see that goals are measurable and we you could measure goals using skill-specific measurements or assessment 
qualitative data through teacher observation. You could use checklists or daily logs, a running record, work samples, rubrics. But it's important to note that if you use a rubric as part of the IEP, so if you say measurement through, uh, you know, the district adopted writing rubric, now you've made the rubric part of the IEP. So you would literally need to a, a staple the rubric to the IEP. You would not use evaluations that are part of eligibility or continuing eligibility for measurement. So for example, you would not use the Woodcock Johnson, a, a score from the from the WJ as part of measurement on a goal because that's something that is only part of eligibility. That's something that's only intended to be used once a year, right? Um, so you would not use that as a data point on a goal. You would not use that to do progress monitoring. You would not want to use state or local assessments such as the NWEA. That is much too broad. You're not going to get the information that you need to do progress monitoring. Grades or report cards, those are much too nebulous, right? An A in my class might not be the same as an A in Ashley's class. So you would not want to measure uh, goals by using grades or report cards. And specific academic curriculums, we're going to talk about why you would not want to use that as well. So this is why you would not want to use specific program or curriculum data. So for example, let's talk about, this is a completely made up, this is the Colette Sullivan made up read, reading program, okay? Level three represents an, it, a reading fluency of 83 words per minute at the third grade level. And reading comprehension is 85% accuracy at the third grade level, right? That's what level three means. If I were to say to you that we want the child to move from level three to level four, but you're a parent and you don't have any idea what level three represents, that doesn't give you any information at all, right? The Colette Sullivan reading program means nothing to you. You don't know what level three means. Also, if this student moves from your district to another district and this other district doesn't have access to the Colette Sullivan reading program, they also don't know what level three is. So if you say that the child's present level is level three, that does not give anybody any information. It might be useful to you because you know what level three is, but it's not helpful to anybody else, right? Also, level three incorporates multiple pieces of information, right? Because it talks about fluency and reading comprehension. So it's, it's multiple skills. So what you'd want to do is you'd want to think about what am I measuring and what am I trying to, to talk about for this student? I used to teach, when I was teaching reading, I taught Spire, right? And Spire talked in levels, but my students didn't need every skill under every level. They might have had mastery over specific skills under the level. So I didn't need to teach them everything. So I didn't, I didn't reference levels, I referenced skills. So think about level three. Maybe the student has great fluency, but poor comprehension, okay? So this student has great fluency, but their reading comprehension is terrible. Therefore, I'm going to focus on the reading comprehension. So my present level might say, child has, 50% accuracy reading comprehension at the third grade level. I'm going to reference the comprehension, not the level, okay? And then I want to move them up. Maybe I want to move them to, you know, 90% accuracy at the third grade level. So you would not want to reference a specific program or a specific curriculum. It's really important to talk about the specific skill deficit that you're pulling out of the curriculum because that way anybody can, can access that skill. You can teach that skill with any curriculum. It's also really important that you're not teaching multiple skills because if you're doing that, you know, you if, if you're trying to teach multiple skills or if you roll in multiple skills in a goal, you could have a student master one skill before the other and how are you going to progress monitor that, okay? So it's really important that you, you pull out the skill and you only teach one at a time and monitor one at a time. SBG4 takes a look at the standard-based goals. And this just really takes a look at making sure that you have a citation linking them 
to the grade level general ed curriculum standards or the grade level at which the child is performing. So just align it to the child's needs, their present level. And this is how we recommend that you cite the main learning results. SBG5 also takes a look at alignment. Remember Ashley said we talk a lot about alignment because your IEP really from top to bottom should be aligned. I was at I was at an, in an SAU yesterday doing some training and the director said he said it perfectly. He said it should be a perfect line. He said it should be a perfect line. I'm like, "Yep, you're absolutely right." So this one takes a look at every goal needs a service, every service needs a goal. So here we go. Sammy spells CVC words, right? So we're talking about that. So you can see he's got a goal around spelling. He's got a goal around writing. He's got a goal around vocab. So you can see that we've got, we've rolled that into writing in his service grid. FDP3 talks about present level for functional and developmental performance. So just like with academic, IDEA requires that this is also a must fill. So as with academic, if you have a student who has only functional programming, but no academic programming, this cannot be blank. So you would also need a statement that stipulates that, right? So Walter is functionally commensurate with peers, has no functional needs at this time. Please do not leave the present level blank. And as with academic, if the child does have goals in this area, trust your data, be very concise, take out struggles with, sometimes seems to, don't use a range, be very, very precise. Alignment, 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 right? Just like academic, make sure your functional goals are measurable. FDP5 takes a look at that. And when we talk about measurable functional goals, we dig in a little bit deeper because we talk about something that we call outcome-based goals or age-appropriate expectations. And this is important because we do see this quite a bit around functional goals. We don't see it as much in academic. Outcome-based goals are those goals that are age-appropriate expectations. Those are those expectations that we want all students to meet, okay? So for example, we want all students to come to school, right? We want all students to complete their work. We want all students to come to school and behave in ways that are not aggressive. We want all students to, um, you know, to do the things that they're supposed to do when they come to school, right? So, for example, if we have a student who cannot do those age-appropriate expectations, we want to not write the goal around those age-appropriate expectations. We want to focus on the skill deficit. Why is it that the student cannot complete their work? Why is it that the student cannot operate without aggression? Okay, we wanna focus on the skill. So let's take a look at Nina. Nina's in first grade. She's been identified with autism. In her IEP, we have evaluations, they support her, her diagnosis of autism. They've been documented clearly in Section 4A. Her IEP team identified her skill deficits as um, she does not know how to request help. Her how statement identifies that those skill deficits impact her ability to engage socially with her peers, causes aggressions, right? So because she has this very specific skill deficit, she is unable to reach that age appropriate expectation of a day without aggressions. Therefore, we're not going to write a goal around reduced aggressions. However, we will write a goal around requesting help, right? Because we think that that's what's interfering with her ability to get through her day without aggressions. So we have our present level. When prompted by an adult, so she's being prompted, Nina will pick up a help card, reach and release to a communicative partner, partner in 100% of opportunities. So she's doing that when prompted. Our goal is 
when given specially designed instruction, we want Nina to independently pick up the help card, relate, reach and release to a communicative partner when presented with situations that require her to do so in 70% of opportunities as measured by data collection, teacher observation and reduced aggressions. So you can see that our percentage went down, right? But our rigor went up, right? We went from prompted by an adult to independent, which is a much bigger expectation. So it made sense that we went from 100 to 70. And our measurement includes that data collection piece, teacher observation, and reduced aggression, right? So if the help card is working, then the, the aggressions should go down. We want to see the aggression, the aggressions going down. However, for the purposes of progress monitoring, we're not measuring aggressions. We're measuring her ability to use help because that's the skill deficit. Does that make sense for people? Because when I talk about outcomes, this for me was a really, really hard shift. As I mentioned at the beginning, I worked with kids with autism for a long time and I was every single one of my functional goals was outcome based. Every single one of them. I was measure I was writing goals that said, you know, so and so will reduce aggressions, so and so will re reduce biting, so and so will reduce bolting. So this was a tough one for me. So again, Nina, we want Nina to decrease the number of aggressions she exhibits across the day. That's that outcome. That is the age appropriate expectation. But that's not what her goal is. Her goal is to request help. That's what we're going to that's what we're going to teach her. So if you're thinking about this, we would ask you to consider if the child has communication deficits, teach them to request a break, teach them to say all done. And for my speech paths out there, I'm sure that you have lots of other suggestions, right? Lots of other things that you would teach. If the child has anxiety, teach them first then, teach them non-preferred and preferred, teach them calming or other communication skills. If the child is impulsive, teach them to use a visual schedule or a timer self-control, self-regulation skills, right? These are just a few simple examples, but I know that if I asked you guys to drop some in the chat box, you would give me lots and lots of others. But the focus here for this slide is just to help you think about, you're not going to, you're not going to write a goal that says child will reduce anxiety, right? You know you want the child to be less anxious, but you're going to teach them the skills, the tools that will help them to be less anxious, okay? So here's an example of how that might look on your IEP. So currently, the child can utilize a tool from her individualized toolkit with support from an adult when prompted to do so in one out of five opportunities. So that's the skill deficit. So when given specially designed instruction and consult from an OT, the child will improve self-regulation skills as demonstrated by independently utilizing a tool from her individualized toolkit including, but not limited to, a break card, a health card, a fidget, a first thin board, or similar, to aid in self-regulating to an expected state in four out of five opportunities as measured by blah, 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 okay? So you can see how, again, we're teaching self-regulation. And this goal was written back when COVID was hot and heavy, and we were trying to work on teaching the child to wear, increase their time wearing a mask, we were not going to write a goal around mask wearing because that was the expectation at the time for everybody, but we had students who couldn't wear masks, right? So we had to teach the skills that would facilitate increased mask wearing. Okay. FDP six is alignment again around those functional goals. Every goal needs a service. Every service needs a goal, just like with the academic component, right? So if you've got a goal, make sure that there is a, a service to support that goal. One of the, one of the um, places that we see this as an error quite frequently would be around consultation. So in this example, you can see that in that second goal, you can see by June 2023, given SDI BCBA consultation. And then if you look 
on the in the service grid, you can see other BCBA consultation. Make sure that if you have consultation in a service, that consultation is in a goal. It can be embedded in an existing goal. It can be in it. It can be its own goal. However, it makes sense to you is fine with us. But consultation needs to be in a goal if it is in a service and vice versa. Any questions? Anything in chat or does anybody want to come off mute? Nothing in chat. Nothing in chat. Am I going too fast or is everybody feeling okay? Fight group. Okay. Got some thumbs up and thumbs smiles up. and nods. So I think they're okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Ashley. All right. SAS1 is where we take a look at section six. So this is the supplementary aid services, modifications, and our supports to be provided to the child. So the important thing here to remember is there are to be no blanks going across. So if you start to fill in on the left-hand side, make sure that you fill in all the way across. So if you fill in the left, you need to go all the way across, make sure location, frequency, duration, is all the way across, don't leave any blanks. Um, other, you can see how that, location could be general ed, special ed, or both. Frequency could be documented as needed. Um, discussion of progress and accommodations is not consultation. This can be documented in section six as an accommodation. And we're gonna talk more about consultation. ALT1 is about the alternate, ass alternate assessment, and that just cannot be blank. Section 6B cannot be blank. So yes, if the child meets the qualifications outlined in the participation decision flow, tar flow chart, and if the child does meet those qualifications, you would just want to include a little explanation there and include that explanation. And then the child would need those, um, those um, objectives, but it just cannot be blank. There are the standards and there's an example of how the objectives might look. SBC1 is where we take a look at the service grid, and this is that alignment piece, but it's the alignment piece on the other direction. So this would be, for example, when we get to the service grid, this is when we take a look at the service grid and we look back to make sure that there's alignment from the service grid back to goals. So again, if I see consultation in the service grid, I'm gonna flip back to make sure that there's, there's consultation in a goal. And you can see here there is, there's OT consultation. I flip back, there's OT uh, consult in the goal, as well as self-regulation. SVC2 is about those special ed and related services to be provided. Remember that the child's needs drive the services, not the school or the program schedule. And also, you want to make sure that the position, all of these are filled in, the position, the location, the frequency, the duration. Um, one of the errors that we see quite frequently is ESY dates. Make sure that your ESY dates are only for those ESY times and dates. Do not put ESY dates as the duration of the entire IEP, because if you do, what that says, in essence, is that you are going to provide extended school year over February break, April break, Christmas break, and I know that's not what you intend. Um, just make sure it's that that summer summer time. Um, frequency, how you choose to document it, is completely up to you. But just make sure it's it's understandable to everybody who reads the IEP. Location, special ed, general ed, or both. The position responsible must be certified special ed or licensed um, related service providers. You would not want to put um, ed tech, CODA, that does not go here. It's Those would go in accommodations. This is just for those certified special ed, uh, speech path, OT, PT. Um, 
In terms of whether or not a speech or language provider is a direct service provider, that would only be direct service if the child is obviously, if they're a child with a speech or language impairment solely, or if they're a speech or language impairment as part of a multiple disability, or if the child is a child identified with autism and speech and language is their only service. Otherwise, they would be a related service provider. And then the consultation so question about the the frequency. So yeah. clear to everyone, right? So let's say it's 30 minutes weekly. Um, I just that's understood that it's 30 minutes weekly while school is in session within the September to say May timeline. And if we have a February break and an April break, then we that is not that week is kind of out of that. Is that right? Yeah. Or do we yeah. Okay. I'm just asking to make yeah, yeah, sure yeah. It's the understanding. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Consultation is another area that are, uh, we are seeing across the state as being misunderstood. So consultation is really goal specific. Okay. Consultation is not about teacher to teacher check-in. Teacher to teacher check-in is more about what you would document in section six. So if you're going to put that in section six, we would ask you to call it anything other than accommodation. I mean, anything other than consultation. You could put teacher to teacher check-in, however you want, to, you want to document it, just do not call it consultation because consultation is goal specific. And that really is about ensuring that skills that are previously taught in a more restrictive setting are being carried over into a less restrictive setting and it is goal specific. So giving consultation, child will, blah, blah, blah. If you are doing that, that teacher to teacher check-in, you can just put that in section six, okay? And you can call it, you know, you, you know, um, oh gosh, what is it? What is the guidance that we've called it? I can't even remember. Collaboration. Collaboration. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. Yes. So you could put teacher to teacher collaboration. You know, if there's a different word that you want to use in section six, that would be perfectly fine. But our guidance would be do not put consultation in section six because consultation would, would go in section seven. And that really is goal specific. Okay. LRE, least restrictive, that is in section eight. Paula, and can I stop you for a second? Please do. Just before we get too far from um, consultation, there's a question in the chat about whether consultation can be the only service a student receives. Um, um, my question to you would be, if the child is only getting consultation, where's the SDI? Like, does the child really need, you know, remember special education is really about that SDI. So does the child really need SDI? Well, or was so, so that was my question. So I, I, this is a student that I, is just becoming my student, right? Just yeah. moved up to seventh grade. And so on the IEP, it only says consultation, like 15 minutes a month. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was checking in about it with that student, the student was like, it wasn't really checking with the student, it was checking with the teacher. So I have to get it clarified, but I'm thinking if that's the only service, it's not SDI with a student, it's a check-in with a teacher. So I'm not sure why that student has an IEP, but it's good to follow up on. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good question. So if it's not goal related, then my response to that would be you might want to meet with your team and have that conversation. You know, would it make more sense to put the child on a 504 and take a look at accommodations? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's no goal specific to that consult, I, I, I would I would guess not. But it, it might make sense to have a have a meeting. Thank you. I'm not, 
I'm not trying to be deliberately vague, but I don't I don't know the student. But if there's if there's not consultation is goal specific. So if the child isn't working on a goal related to that consult service, my guess would be no. Thank you. You're One welcome. more question, Colette, too. Um, just that in a previous MDOE training or IEPs, it was stressed that consult was always adult to adult. Is this still accurate? Um, I don't know that, uh, I mean, it, it, it's goal specific. So I don't know that we've ever said adult to adult. I would need to. I would need to talk to the team about that. So uh, let me let me let me talk to the team. Thank you. All right, LRE. So this right here is straight out of Muser. And if Jennifer would he was here, this is Jennifer's pet peeve because the prompt on the IEP is a little bit different than this slide, which is straight out of Muser. And this is talking about nature and severity of the disability. So this really talks about why can the student, why does the student need to be removed, right? What is the nature and severity of the disability of the child? Why do they need to be pulled? Why are they in a different setting? So here's an example of Sammy. And oftentimes when we're on site, we see paragraphs about the LRE. The LRE is a very quick little sentence. It's, you know, I, I see people working really, really hard and IEPs are hard to write anyway. They're a lot of work. So save yourself some time. It's a quick sentence. So Sammy's other health impairment due to ADHD is to such a degree that he requires individual and small group instruction in the special ed environment. That's all it is. His ADHD, his OHI requires him to get some individual and small group instruction. Okay. That's his LRE statement. Dib one. This is a big one to pay attention to. This talks about the disability alignment. So this is a big one because it really is about alignment between programming and the child's disability category. So for example, what we typically see, there are two big ones that we typically see and both are an impediment to fate. So if we come on site and we see, we see these, they have to be corrected pretty quickly. They have to be corrected before the rest of your cat because they are an impediment to fate. So what we typically see would be the first one here, which is OHI. So if the child is identified with other health impairment, but they do not have functional programming to address the adverse effect presented by the OHI, that would have to be addressed pretty quickly because OHI is a functional disability, right? So you would need to have functional programming in there to address that adverse impact. Same with SLD. If the student has a specific learning disability, but there's no academic programming in there, you would need to address that, that IEP pretty quick. So you would either need to amend the IEP and add programming in there that's appropriate for both of those disability categories, or maybe the disability category isn't appropriate. You know, you would just need to get the team together and take a look at those and fix those one way or the other. So if you, if we identify a Dib 1, that's what we call it, a Dib 1, then we would talk to you about getting those getting those fixed within a month, okay? APG5 and FDG2, those are both talking about academic and functional annual progress of the child. And these are also both very big ones because these are based on that annual progress. And these came about due to around that Andrew F case, which was a Supreme Court case. And these are just making sure that your IEPs show progress from year to year, that your goals increase in rigor or independence or skill level. And one way to make sure that this happens is really to take a good hard look at your data and to make sure that you're using your data and you're analyzing your data to make sure that your programs are effective. 
And if your data is showing you that your programs are not effective, that you're changing them. If you're just taking data, putting them in a put your putting your data sheets in a binder and putting your binder up on a shelf and never looking at them, then it pains me to say this, but I would say don't even bother taking data because you're not using it. Um, and it pains me to say that because I am a data lover and um, I am a firm believer in data. But I mean, data is effective if you use it, but you have to analyze it and then you have to take some action with your data. And I, you know, I was I was not in the classroom with Andrew F. So I don't really know what their data looked like or if they analyzed it or anything. But I have to believe that if they did, that they might have had a different outcome. So when you take your data, it's really, really important that you use it to drive your programming and to really figure out how your programming is working. Because if your students are not making progress, it's up to you to change programming so that they can make progress. And that is something that we will look at. Paula, <clears throat> before yes, you move too far past it, um, can you give some examples of what functional programming would look like or might look like for OHI? Absolutely. Um, so it might be, so go, So if we were to go back to that slide that had um, those broad functional components, so it might be something around self-regulation or um, organization or any of those functional, those broad functional categories would be a really good place to start. Think about those those skill deficits around those functional areas for the student. Thanks, Colette. Yeah, of course. Any other questions before I move on? We're almost done. Okay. So professional development, we have all district IEP trainings scheduled on these three dates. The registration links are here. These are, a long, these are long trainings. These are about two and a half hours long, but what we do is we walk through the entire IEP, give you lots of examples. Um, there are little quizzes embedded in them um, and you will get contact hours. So th those are there for you if you're interested. All right, transition plans. For those of you who are high school teachers, we will look at transition plans as part of this process. So the code for the first bit is TRA1, and that is, we look for that in the advanced written notice. So this is for children who are ninth grade or above. We look in the advanced written notice to make sure that the purpose of the meeting is indicated. So we just look to make sure that you have checked off that the meeting is documented that post-secondary goals and transition services are going to be discussed. TRA2, there's evidence that the child was invited to attend. So you could choose to just document the child here in the in the, the dear, mom, dad, and Bobby, or you might choose to list the student as a participant. TRA3 is also in the advanced written notice and in section 9G of the advanced written notice. And that is that if it's appropriate, a representative of any participating agency is invited to the IEP team meeting with a with prior consent. And there's a this document is in the procedural manual. And this, sh this shows that the public agency, which is the SAU, must invite a representative that, of that participating agency. So you would want to document on this on this uh, permission, this notice, the consent or lack of consent to invite the agencies. This document needs to be completed prior to the advanced written notice for every meeting where post-secondary planning was discussed. This is not a one and done at the beginning of the year. This needs to be completed prior to every meeting where post-secondary planning is discussed. TRA-4, we would look in the written notice, and this is just where we would look to make sure that you just a simple statement that says you reviewed and updated transition goals. TRA-5, we would look in section 9B, 
And this is where we would look for our documentation that transition assessments were completed. Best practice, because we look for movement in the transition plan, and one way to document movement would be to include years to show that movement. So you can see here that there was an assessment done in 21, and then in 22, there were two assessments done. If the student was a freshman, it would make sense that you would only have one assessment here. But if the student was a senior and there was only one assessment, we might ask you why that was the case. So if the student is a senior, you know, an upperclassman, we would look to see for multiple assessments. So it would make sense for you to date them just so that, again, we can see that movement. 6A, we would look for measurable post-secondary goals addressing education or training after high school. So you can see here we have Dan and he wants to attend a four-year college or university to study marketing or receive on-the-job training to become a carpenter. So he's hoping to do one or the other, and that's fine that they're incorporating both. You would never want to document a specific, the name of a specific college or a specific university because there has been um, cases where students didn't get into a particular, a particular college. You would not want to have that. Section 6B is where you would link their post-secondary education to their employment. So here we have Dan again, and he wants to go to university or college for marketing or carpentry. And here we go. He also wants to work in marketing or carpentry. So you can see how those align. And then 6C is about post-secondary independent living. So Dan is also a student who is currently accessing mental health supports in his community. So even though Dan um, is not you, you would want to incorporate this for all students. Um, my daughter is a sophomore in college and she was not a special education student. However, she is currently, a, a, you know, she's a sophomore in college and she's having some struggles with independent living, you know, just, just being able to, um, you know, grocery shop or balance a budget, just some of those things that have to do with independent living, right? So, so think about those things for all students, not just those with significant cognitive deficits. What will all young adults need to be able to live independently? So think about those sort of broadly. TRA-7 is courses of study, and those should align to those courses of study that will help the student meet their post-secondary goals. Our guidance would be not to incorporate the word elective, go through the course catalog and choose those courses, again, that align to post-secondary goals. So think about this for Dan, you've got, he's got intro to marketing, he's got carpentry one, carpentry two, he's got intro to business. So you would want to um, think about, plan out his four years, and when he's a sophomore, for example, and he says, you know what, I don't want to do carpentry anymore. I want to be a photographer. Great. Then you can take those carpentry courses off and you can plug photography and you can change that as he moves through. Right. Anybody know any high schoolers who changed their mind? I tell you, when my daughter was in high school, she changed her mind a million times. That's OK. But you do want to project out. And if they change their mind, that's fine. But do not put the word electives in there. Open the course catalog and plug in what the child projects that they think they want. If they change their mind, that's perfectly fine. Transition services. This has been a problem across the state because what we have been seeing are child will statements. You do not want to document child will statements. So if you look at this, um, look at the first one where it says education, instruction, and related services. These are all services that are to be completed by the adults in the school and the community. So where it says education, instruction, and related, you would not want to see Dan will receive special ed. Dan will receive speech and therapy. Dan will volunteer because these are not Dan will. These are the adults, right? So 
these are not Dan's responsibility, just like the services in section seven of the IEP are not Dan's responsibility. These are what the adults are going to provide for Dan. So you do not want Dan will statements. You want to just bullet the activities, take the Dan will out. The other thing that we often see is Dan is going to volunteer. Dan is a dog walker. Dan is participating in Boy Scouts. Take the student right out of these statements and just bullet the activities, okay? And um, bullet the list. These should include future activities. Um, you can leave previous years in services in the section. Um, and they, they could um, include those educational, those instruction, those related services. TRA 9, this is when you link back the transition services back to goals that are probably and should be already in existence for the student. You would not want to write a transition goal. And the reason why you wouldn't want to do that is because it's probably going to be a very awkward goal that you're not going to be able to measure. So you would not want to write a goal that says, you know, Dan will um, go into carpentry and build a house, right? You're not going to follow Dan when he becomes a carpenter. You're not going to be able to measure what Dan does when he leaves school and becomes a carpenter, right? So you want to really just attach it to an existing goal that makes sense giving the post-secondary plan for Dan. So we've got Dan here again. We use Dan a lot. So given social work services, we've already identified that Dan is a guy who has anxiety, right? So in preparation for attending a four-year college or university to study marketing or carpentry, Dan will work on managing his anxiety. So managing his anxiety, that's a goal that Dan already works on. It's a goal that is in existence for him anyway. It's a functional goal. And that is also a goal that will benefit him. He needs to work on that in order to be to to function in his world no matter what he does, right? So to be successful in marketing, to be successful as a carpenter, he needs to be able to manage his 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 anxiety. So it made sense for Dan to embed that sentence about preparation for attending a four-year college, right? So we embedded that sentence into an existing goal. We did not create a transition goal. So you would want to just go ahead and embed that in to a goal that already exists in section five. These are all district B13 trainings. These are about an hour and a half. And you can see the dates here with the registration links. And you will also receive contact hours for these. Questions? All right. Out of unit students. So as part of this process, we would ask that you would review one student from each out of unit placement as part of your self-assessment. Because what we do is we come in and we look at the process from those students who, if they were placed within the past two years, if they were placed Longer than that, we don't need to look at them, only if they were placed within the past two years. All right, other considerations. So for your desk audit, these are the pieces we look at for the out of unit placement. This is that process piece. This is included. Um, so you can see for this component along the left-hand side, those are those codes, just like we looked at for all the other pieces. You can see those codes along the left. Then that center column, that's exactly what we look for. And then the far, far right, you can see exactly where we look for each one of those components. So you'll know exactly what we're looking for for that out of unit um, process. All right, what do you mean by out of unit, please? So if you have a student, for example, that has been placed in any out of unit placement, so like Sweetser, Spurwink, Margaret Murphy, any of those out of unit placements, out of district. Out of district, thanks. Yeah. 
eligibility form. So these are part of your, these are part of the desk audit. Um, so your director has all of this information along the left-hand side also are the codes, the summary of performance document we look at, the, the SLD form, speech and language form, and the form for determination of adverse effect. So for the summary of performance, we ask that there are no blank boxes. And section one, which is the academic section, we, make, we wanna make sure that there is data in that section. The SLD form, please make sure that there are no blank boxes. Verification must include data. Make sure you include those strengths and weaknesses. That is the only eligibility form that must be signed. And for all of the eligibility forms, it's really important that you there is a statement in the corresponding written notice. It's just going to be just a quick sentence that says, something along the lines of the IEP reviewed, the IEP team reviewed and completed the eligibility form, the SLD eligibility form, something like that. Speech and language eligibility criteria, again, no blank boxes or areas. Make sure you document the criteria that documents that adverse effect. Make sure that your verification includes data. Document and include all of the severity rating scales, even if some of them are not uh, applicable to that student. We still need to see all of them. And then again, document the completion of the form in that corresponding written notice. Adverse effect form, no blank boxes. Up in the top left-hand side of the form, you're going to document the reason for the use of the form. Is it for initial eligibility or continuing eligibility? For this form, NA means that it's not available. Verification needs data. And again, please document a sentence or something that just documents that you've completed the form. And the procedural manual, which we included at the beginning, will outline each one of these eligibility forms as well as the written notice itself in quite a bit more detail. Call it quick question about the SLD form. Um, can a family, if the meeting's held virtually, can the family agree to have their names typed in as their signature? Um, I yes. I but I would document very, very clearly in the written notice that that's what happened. All right, we have an office hour on our website from 92822 that really focus on the eligibility process and all of the related forms. And here is the link for that. So if you need more information about that. B11 is a federal indicator that we report to the Office of Special Education Programs or OSEP, which is federal DOE. And um, these are the two findings that we look at. INR1 is the procedural safeguards. And what we look at for that is just to make sure that procedural safeguards were offered to the parent at initial referral. And we look to make sure that they're offered at point of first contact. And what that means is that when you have an initial referral, initial referral, those procedural safeguards are offered with that advanced written notice. And that is when you're you first send out that advanced written notice when you're talking about what evals are we gonna do, not, not at that eligibility meeting, that very, very first meeting when you're like, listen, I think this child needs a little bit more support. What are the evals we're gonna do? Who are we gonna invite that very first meeting? So that's when you wanna send out those procedural safeguards. You can do those as an enclosure. You can incorporate that in the written notice. Our best guidance would be to include, in, include them as an enclosure, okay? INR3, is about that timeline, all right? So evaluations need to be completed within 45 school days from the date of consent. And that, that, that clock starts when that, when that consent is received back to the SAU. So make sure that that, that that timeline starts, okay? And that is up to the SAU to document on that consent when it's received back, all right? So that is something that we look for, and that is something that we have to report back to DOE, the federal DOE. 
And again, procedural manual, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. Call it. Before you go on, I just wanted to let you know our colleagues are here. Carly and Jennifer are with us. So if you need a little bit of a break, they're here. Um, Thank yeah. you. All right. Abbreviated day. We were tasked about a year or two ago to start to take a look at abbreviated day. So abbreviated day, we will only look at this, obviously, if you have students on abbreviated day. So when we come on site, we will ask you, do you have students on abbreviated day? And there are only two circumstances which for which this can happen, educational or medical. And we have two documents here that will outline exactly how this should look. The first one is for educational. And again, as with our other one pagers, along the left-hand side are the findings. The middle column tells you exactly what we're looking for. And the right-hand column tells you exactly where we're going to look to find it. The most important thing for abbreviated day is the written notice, written notice, written notice, written notice. Okay, we really depend on the written notice for the abbreviated day because we really look to see what is the, the basis of the abbreviated day. Why is the student on an abbreviated day? Is it for educational or medical reasons? Is the LRE percentage based on a full school day as it should be? How is the student going to access their curriculum and their IEP services? How are you making sure that that happens? How will they access assessments? What is their re-entry plan? How are you going to make sure that they are going to move back towards participation in a full day? If the child is out for more than 45 calendar days, you must reconvene every 20 school days, which means you need to have that advanced written notice and you need to be documenting that very clearly in your written notice. And you need to be documenting in your written notice, what's their progress like? What does that look like in their educational setting? And what are you, what are you, how is their programming changing? How are you facilitating their return? So your written notice is your best friend when we're looking at abbreviated day. So really think about your documentation for this piece. Abbreviated day for medical, as Jennifer says, it's much easier. It's much easier, but it's still, that documentation piece is just huge. I can't say it enough. So again, along the left-hand side are the findings. Along the middle is what we look for, no surprises. And along the right is where we look for it. But again, written notice is the biggest piece. So again, educational or medical, your LRE percentage should be based on a full six-hour day. How is the student accessing their curriculum and their services, as well as assessments? If the student is on abbreviated day for medical reasons, you must meet every 90 calendar days and you must document their progress, amend their IEP, document it very clearly in the written notice. And then you're going to reconvene when the student is medically able to do so. And this entire process, we will look in the written notice. Did I say that enough? In the written notice to really clarify how they're doing, how they're moving back, what's the process. There is a link to a recorded training on abbreviated day. It's right here. Jennifer put this together for us. So this will, again, go into much more detail about this. Questions? Good. Thanks for sticking with us, guys. I know this is a lot. All right, our site visits. These are some timelines begin in January. We are asking that you submit your self-assessment and all of the desk audit evidence by December 1st, 2023. You can submit your evidence to our secure monitoring inbox. This is just for us. We are the only ones who have access to this. So it is very secure. You don't need to redact anything. You don't need to cross anything out. This is only for our team. You can choose to snail mail it to this address. It will go right to Julie and she will get it to the correct team member. Um, in the past, when, well, when COVID hit, we gave um, SAUs the option of allowing us to come on site and do some or part of the desk audit because we knew how overwhelmed everybody is. I know now that COVID is not so uh, pervasive, but everybody is still incredibly overwhelmed. 
So we are still offering that as an option. If you would like us to come on site and do some or all of your desk audit when we come on site, that is still an option. And you can let us know that ahead of time. You can let us know that the day before. You can let us know that when we walk through the door. That is completely up to you. Um, we understand that times are, you know, people are struggling with staff. We know that staffing is still a huge issue. So we will trust you to manage that how you best see fit. Um, so we will trust you to let us know in a way that makes sense for you, but we are still offering that up if that is helpful for you. Once we come on site, do the verification on site, you will receive the Friday after your site visit, you will receive what we call pre-findings and you will have one month to submit evidence of correction of pre-findings. The benefit of doing pre-findings is that we will go onto your document and we will correct any of the pre-findings that you choose to do and we will change any of your errors to 100% compliance. And what that means is if it's changed to 100%, it will not show up on your cap. The pre-findings are areas that are an indication of systemic non, um, they, are, they are proof that it is not a systemic issue. Right. So it might be a one off. It might be, you know, an, an error that just shows up on one or two students. It is not something that is pervasive across your IEP. So we give you the opportunity to correct it. Correction of pre findings is optional. And if you have five pre findings and you only choose to correct one or two, that is also fine. Um, your DIB ones, that disability alignment, those are the ones we talked about that are an impediment to fate. You will have one month to correct those. This is all. This is not optional, and it may result in a prong two cap finding, depending on the percent of noncompliance. And if you do have a Dib one finding, we will talk to you very specifically about what that looks like for you in that moment. Okay. Because OSEP, the big DOE, federal DOE, has issued new guidance around how we have to look at your findings. We now have been tasked with um, looking at um, sending out um, findings and guidance around findings within a three month timeline. So for visits now that take place between January and March, your cap will be issued on April 30th, which means that your cap will be due February 28th, 2025. For visits that take place between April and May, your cap will be issued June 30th and it will be due April 30th, 2025. All of our caps now run a 10 month timeline, which gives us a two month buffer at the end for people who potentially need a two month buffer and that's fine. Um, this new OSEP guidance, we are going to be doing a presentation at MADSEC to talk about this new guidance and how we intend to address this guidance. So for those of you who are going to MADSEC in October, we will be talking about that. Prong one and prong two. For those of you who have not done this with us, prong one is correction to non-compliance from any of those files that you looked at on your self-assessment or that were reviewed as, oh, we don't look at an EMT anymore, you're gonna love this, but that were looked at as part of your self-assessment or that we reviewed on site, okay? Those were, um, the, the, the change from OSEP requires us now to look at and require correction of each instance of non-compliance. This is new. Previously, we could look at a subset and just sort of expect that every error would be corrected at annuals. Now the federal DOE requires us to look at and 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 um, for you to demonstrate correction of each area of non-compliance. This is quite a change for us. So we're gonna talk about that at MADSEC. Prong two is evidence of systemic change from those files that were not included in the self-assessment or were not reviewed on site. So those are based on the percent of compliance. So you, when you get your cap, the number of prong two pieces that you will have to submit to us will be identified on your cap. So that will be clarified when you receive your cap. Okay, 
We are no longer doing that electronic monitoring tool. We got lots. I've been in this position, this position for two years, but I've been with the DOE for five. And year after year after year, we got feedback that the electronic monitoring tool was bulky. I mean, it was a great, it was, it was a great tool, but it was very bulky and it was very difficult. So, Jennifer, do you have the Word document that you could share? Well, you keep calling it a Word document, but it's not. And yes, I do. <laughs> Forms, whatever it is. I'm kicking you off sharing screen. Okay. okay. You're awfully sassy today, Jennifer. It's not even Thursday. I know. I'm feeling sassy. Can you see the form? Yes. Okay. So this is what your self-assessment is now a form instead of that terrible um, spreadsheet. We have this model form. Ashley so kindly put the link to this in the chat box. You can also get to it through our website. Um, feel free to just go on here and practice if you want to before you um, use yours. Each SAU has their own link to their own self-assessment. Um, feel free to share that link within district if you have other people um, helping you with the self-assessment. If you have IEP coordinators or whoever is gonna help you, it, more than one person can have the link. It will feed into a spreadsheet that we can grab. But this model one, you can put anything you want in here and nothing's gonna get saved. So. You just have your regular information that you would put into that spreadsheet. Click the um, disability. If you click multiple disabilities, it'll bring up a box here to put those concomitant disabilities. So you can put um, OHI and SLD. I'm just doing the easiest ones to. Um, so then it just goes through all those findings that Ashley and Colette just walked you through. Um, it tells you what makes it compliant, what makes it not compliant, what's a yes, what's a no. If you say no, it's not compliant, it's gonna bring up a box and ask you why. So just a little comment, it's not required. Um, you can put it in or not, but you know, just some kind of little comment like that. Um, we'll go into, I'm just going to say yes for a few so we can get on. Okay. Some of them have NA. Some are just yes and no. Some have NA. So this is academic gaps. You might have a student that doesn't have any academic gaps. So in that case, you're going to hit NA and it's going to bring you right to functional gaps. So here we have functional gaps are compliant. We're going to go down how statements there and we have alignment to goals. So we'll do that, and then we're gonna hit next. So um, there's room to look at five academic goals. So um, look at your first five academic goals. For the first, for academic goal number one, there's two yeses. So one is yes, if there's a goal there and there's baseline data. The other is yes, for the student who doesn't have academic goals because they don't have any academic gaps, but that statement that I'm sure Colette talked about is in that first present level that says that they're on par with peers. So I'm gonna click that one because we don't have any academic goals. Functional goals, we are asking, we used to look at the first five functional goals, but for those really involved kids, the first five might all be speech and language goals. And then we don't see the behavior goals and the OT goals and the PT goals. So we ask that you review at least one goal from each provider. Um, if there's five goals or more, review five goals. If you have to do, you know, if there's speech OT and special ed teacher, do two, two, and one, that kind of a thing. Um, so you click which service provider it is. We have present level. Again, for the first one, we have two different present levels, two different yeses for present level. Um, alignment. This is a very good IEP because they're all yeses. Measurability and alignment to services. So then we're going to go into functional goal two. If there are no more, just hit NA and it'll bring you to the next section. 
So go through it. Again, if you want to do this model one just to practice, put anything you want in there, that's fine. It won't be saved. Um, you were sent your specific SAU link in your August email from your contact person. Thank you, Jennifer. My pleasure. Sorry about the dog barking. All right. We are almost done. Perfect. All right. Carly, you want to speak about this? Hi. Uh, are we on the feedback form? Because I can't see your screen for some reason. Oh, now I can. There we go. I can't, I can never tell if it's just my computer being slow or if it's everyone sees the same thing. Um, yes, yeah, so this is our feedback form and it's also how you get a contact hour. Um, we really appreciate any feedback that you give us. We do use the feedback and we look at it often and we adjust our PD based off of what you all tell us. So it is very much appreciated. Um, also, when you're filling out the form and you're asked to select the training, you're just going to select how to choose. That's the training for today. And enter your email if you would like a contact hour certificate. Um, and just make sure your email is, it, email is spelled correctly so it can get to you. Yeah. Um, and Tara, thank you for that feedback about the forms. I yeah, it's I think it'll be so much easier. I, I'm I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. All right. So Carly and Jen and uh, Julie put this together and I am super jazzed about this. So this is our our all of our PD. This is all of our office hours. This is all of our IEP training, our B13 training. This is everything all in one document. And we are quite proud of this. Our office hours are the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. We um, have taken the IEP training and really tore it apart. We really just kind of broke it apart because the IEP training itself is really long. So we really wanted to just break it down into really smaller, more manageable chunks. I think our shortest one is about 15 minutes. Our longest is an hour. And on our website itself, we have modules so that if you're struggling with present level, you can go on and just look at a 15 minute present level module or if you're, you know, however you choose to look at it. So this will help you with that as well. So this is all here. We also are doing uh, discipline and manifestation determination and special ed law for general ed teachers on 1025 and 410. And we know that discipline and manifestation determination does not, um, it, it, it often starts before it gets to special ed teachers, right? So we are hopeful that you will be willing to share this with your peers and hopefully we can get some, lots of staff there and uh, related service providers. I know we have some related service providers here today, which is fabulous. We're getting more and more, which we love. So writing measurable functional goals, avoiding outcomes and consultation and related service goals in February and May. So uh, share those out widely as well. That'd be really great. These are some resources, our PD calendar, again, links to recording and they all have corresponding PowerPoints. Our special ed resources, laws and regulations, forms and reporting. Our website has been updated. It is so much easier to maneuver around. They did a lot of work on it. Jennifer has been integral and in just really the reorganization of it. It's so much easier. I love it. So feel free to get in there and dig around and let us know what you think. And here is our contact information. Uh, one other thing too, as you're moving through this process or just as you're working on IEP development, if you're in the middle of writing an IEP or filling out a form or you know doing the work that you do every day, if you need feedback, if you have a question or you know I, I'm trying to write this goal and I'm just not really sure, send it to us, email, you know, this is a goal and I'm not really sure if it's measurable or this is a present level and I'm just not really sure. Can you help me look at it? We are happy to do that. That's why, you know, we're really here to help you with it. We are part of your team. And if you send it to us, just do not put a student name on it. Don't put it in an IEP form because, uh, again, per the federal DOE, if we see it on an IEP form, we are mandated to review it 
in our formal capacity. And um, that just sort of opens a whole can of worms. But if you send it to us, you know, hypothetically, here's an IEP. I mean, here's a, here's a goal. Can you look at it? We are happy to do that. We will give you feedback. We will help you make any corrections. And then you can go and turn around and plug it into your IEP. And um, we, we, we really want to help you be successful. So please, please, please feel free to reach out to any of us for that, if that's something that you think would be helpful. And, um, you know, you've got your contact for the person who is helping you with this monitoring and supervision process, but you are welcome to reach out to any of us at any time. So I hope that that is helpful. And um, we look forward to working. We're, we look forward to working with you through this process. And uh, let us know what we can do to help you. Any questions before we let you guys go? No. All right. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for for sticking with us through this long this long thing, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye.